And Major Garrett and Nancy Cordes are in Washington for us uh, this morning, setting that shot up. Uh, well, that that's just a thing of beauty. Major, we're going to get to state pronunciations in just a moment. <laughs> but sure. we do want to start with uh, Trump's latest target du jour on the trail. That is one Bill Clinton seems to be, if nothing else, a fight. The GOP nominee is more than eager in which to engage. And why not? Uh, Bill Clinton said some things that are painfully true about the Affordable Care Act, things the White House would prefer not to recognize. That is, in some instances, if you're a middle-class American, you've paid higher premiums and your coverage has been reduced. And if you're outside of the range of available subsidies and you're a small business, that hurts even more. That's a fact. It is what Hillary Clinton frequently describes as an unfortunate, unforeseen flaw of the Affordable Care Act, and she has put forward a plan to deal with that, essentially allowing those in this part of the economic spectrum to buy into, if they want to, Medicare or Medicaid. But that's not an idea that's generated a tremendous amount of enthusiasm. And what Donald Trump has said frequently is he wants to repeal Obamacare. He says almost nothing about how he would replace it. So this is a very good placeholder for him to say, well, it's not just me. It's Bill Clinton, husband of the Democratic nominee and someone the White House frequently turns to to explain things. Well, he explains something that is not working particularly well with the Affordable Care Act. In the real world, that's already known. In the political world, at least on the Democratic side, that's been something reluctantly dealt with and reluctantly acknowledged with Bill Clinton acknowledging it. Donald Trump thinks he has something to point to and with some degree of advantage. And Nancy, I suppose politically, it, it asked the question all over again, just what sort of surrogate can Bill Clinton be for his wife and certainly just how much damage can they afford from slip ups such as this? Well, you know, they view his memorable speaking style as something that is an asset 95% of the time. Uh, but as John Podesta, the campaign chairman, put it, you know, he's got some colorful language, <laughs> and that's just something that, that the campaign takes into account. Um, I don't think you're going to see a major change in strategy uh, when it comes to dealing with Bill Clinton on the part of the Clinton campaign. Uh, they know that uh, this is all part of the bargain with him, uh, that he can speak to uh, audiences where he's even more popular in some cases than Hillary Clinton. Uh, that he's kind of an energizer bunny and will go uh, anywhere and speak to anyone, whether it's voters or donors. Uh, so, so they view him by and large as a huge asset. And if they have to take the hits every once in a while uh, on something like this, they're willing to do it. They argue that Hillary Clinton actually shares his view uh, that there are parts of the Affordable Care Act that need to be fixed. It's just perhaps that he used uh, language that went a bit further yeah. than she would have. Yeah. If he not, was trying to be helpful, but yeah. he was very candid and very straightforward and very simple in Bill Clinton's stylistic way. He described it quite well. And Donald Trump acts as if, gosh, I wish I'd thought of saying it that way. I can tell you that's a conversation Trump advisors have almost on an hourly basis. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I want to turn uh, folks to the continued fallout from Tuesday's uh, vice presidential debate. Before I, I do, I want to... I want to play a little bit more from Donald Trump. Uh, he had this to say about his uh, running mate yesterday. Get your thoughts on the other side. So how many of you watched the vice presidential debate last night? Mike Pence did an incredible job. And I'm getting a lot of credit because that's really my first so-called choice. That was my first hire, as we would say in Las Vegas. And and I'll tell you, he's a good one. He was phenomenal. He was cool. He was smart. Major Mike Pence said yesterday that from where he sat, Donald Trump won the debate. It would certainly appear that Donald Trump seems to agree with his running mate there. <laughs> so let me tell you something that happens, I've been told, on the Trump plane. There'll be times when Mike Pence will call in and want to talk to Donald Trump about something they're going to do as far as scheduling or a big speech coming up or maybe some policy. And frequently... Trump will say in the middle of it to somebody on the plane, hey, didn't I do a great job picking this guy, my guy? Didn't I do a great job picking this guy? And Pence will be on the other end of the line thinking, are we having this conversation again? Is this happening again? I mean, there is something about Trump that is so self-reverential. And it is, in times, kind of perplexing, other times disarming. 
And he has spontaneously said many times, what a great job I did picking Pence. Well, now that private conversation that Donald Trump frequently has on his own private jet is now spilling out into public. But let's remember, hours after Mike Pence was chosen, there was this brief moment of reconsideration on Trump's part where he wasn't always sure. And it was a decision that was the byproduct of a lot of counseling of Trump on who to pick. He was leaning toward Chris Christie and Newt Gingrich. It's turned out well for Trump, but to call it his own idea and his original concept would be a bit of a stretch. It's always quite heartening, Josh, when Donald Trump says something like this because it's a sign to them uh, that he's not going to suddenly develop more control, let's say, in the next debate than he had in the last debate, that he is sort of, at the end of the day, someone who's got kind of a verbal stream of consciousness, uh, and they feel that it is a sign that you know, he didn't love the fact that Mike Pence got better reviews for his debate performance than Donald Trump did. So Trump needed to try to claim some of the credit for Pence's performance for himself. And they think that that could make him even a little more testy, a little more erratic in Sunday night's debate. Do you think there's something to that, uh, Major, especially with regard to uh, the scene that you uh, just shared with us that plays out on occasion on the plane? I think Trump wanted to see Mike Pence do well. He knew strategically a solid performance from Pence was something his campaign desperately needed, largely because of the bad week or two Trump had preceding it. So Trump understands that. Whether he likes to admit that, another issue entirely. But if Trump wants to win the presidency, he needed Pence to do what he did on the debate night, which is build a solid foundation beneath Trump. And I will tell you this, those in the Trump inner circle certainly hope, and I've said this before, that Trump watching Pence will tell him, hey, you can learn things from this. You can actually benefit if you spend a bit more time preparing, if you take the task of the debate and its format and what you can do and what you can avoid in terms of errors more seriously, you can have a better performance. And there are some signs that is seeping in. Trump is spending a good deal of time today in New York on debate prep. He's not going to have any campaign events tomorrow. He was scheduled to go to, well, at least in theory, scheduled to go to Ohio yet again. Not going to do that. Going to work on more debate prep tomorrow. So that is in schedule alone. We'll see how studious he is about it in reality. But in scheduling, he's put together a lot more time and set aside much more time for debate prep for round two than he did for round one. Well, what that might mean for both candidates, I suppose we'll find out three days hence. Major Garrett, Nancy Cordes, as always, the insight is appreciated. Thanks, it. Josh.